And Rick Singel, I want to begin with you and the and the local feel that this could have here in New York City, where so many friends of mine have relatives and friends in Israel now. Yes, Lawrence, at any given time, there are as many as a half a million Americans in Israel visiting or living there. Uh, this is the largest uh, population of Jews outside of Israel in New York City, so people have a special connection there. I think what's happened to Israelis is unprecedented. Uh, they had been inculcated with a sense of security vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Gaza Strip and the uh, horrific crimes done by Hamas is something that they haven't expected. I think it's something that will be difficult for Prime Minister Netanyahu because his brand is, I will keep you safe, I won't negotiate, and, and that isn't what happened. And Robin, a point uh, Nick Christoph made earlier tonight, which is that some people who think that uh, Sympathy with the plight of people living in Gaza, the non-combatants living in Gaza, uh, is somehow should somehow translate to support for Hamas. There, is, there were people, no doubt, who were murdered in this attack who were strong sympathizers uh, with the people in Gaza and may have even participated in protests on behalf of the people in Gaza. Absolutely. There is a great divergence of opinion within the Palestinian community about what the course ahead is. Uh, who its allies are, what the prospects are of some kind of peace agreement. Hamas does not represent all the Palestinians, but it does represent an important idea that represents today the greatest challenge to the Israeli state and will for the foreseeable future. The great challenge for Israel today is that it can decisively punish Hamas, decapitate its the movement, destroy its arsenal, obliterate its command posts. But the idea of Hamas, the non-state actor, is not going to disappear through the use of military force. And that's the great challenge. So that short-term, Israel can prevail. But long-term, the idea, the opposition, the fury, and the passions will continue to be a challenge for the Jewish state. Uh, Peter Barnard, uh, it's uh, less than a week ago, I think it was the middle of last week, where I read one of your regular emails on the situation there, uh, in which you expressed strong doubt, to put it mildly, that an alliance uh, between Israel and Saudi Arabia would somehow be stabilizing. Right, because the, a Saudi-Israel deal can't deal with the fact that Israelis and Palestinians live next to one another, and ultimately they, their fates are intertwined. And so what Hamas did is so horrible that I am still can't get my head around it. Everybody I know has just been checking with people in Israel, and the kids are being called up. I mean, it's it's just unfathomable. Um, but the reality is that making life in Gaza even more uninhabitable, it's already been declared unlivable by the United Nations, making it more uninhabitable, uninhabitable is not going to keep Israelis safe. If a 60, if the blockade were, were going to keep Israel, Israel safe, this wouldn't have happened on Saturday. Israel has pummeled Gaza again and again. It's blockaded it for 16 years. The fundamental reality is that unless Palestinians can live with dignity and freedom and safety, the ability of Israeli Jews to live with dignity and safety will always be under threat. And uh, Rick, given that Hamas does not want uh, the kind of world that we would all hope to see, that Israelis are living safely, people in Gaza are living safely, uh, and in a kind of harmonious relationship where they can work in both places, uh, Hamas is in an active war against that. that that's what their war is against. Yes, they're in an active war against the state of Israel. Ironically, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu tried to make overtures to Hamas in, in, the, in Gaza. Uh, they, they gave, he gave passports for them to come and work in Israel. They have been funding public work projects there. Um, that's the irony here, which is that he is the person whose, whose brand is, you can never trust a Palestinian, who did trust them, because he wanted to try to divide Gaza from the West Bank. And I agree with Peter's point that you can't have a larger peace in the Middle East, even the so-called Abraham Accords with the Sunni nations, which is a good thing. You can't have that ultimately with Saudi Arabia unless you have some dispensation with the Palestinians. Uh, Robin Wright, what should Israel's strategic objective be? Well, a short-term strategic objective is to uh, 
counter the Hamas influence to beat it militarily, to eliminate its leaders. Uh, the long term, that's a great challenge. And the thing that strikes me so often about this war is that Israel may have engaged in a, ta in, a, in a terrible intelligence failure, but it also had a long experience in dealing with Hezbollah in neighboring Lebanon. And Israel was there for many, many years, and at the end of the day, engaged in a unilateral withdrawal because it knew it couldn't beat Hezbollah, it couldn't beat the idea, the influence, and the, the passions. And so this is that experience replicated uh, it was an even smaller militia. Hezbollah is much better armed. And so I think there's a real, uh, this plays out on a lot of levels when you think about the past, the present, and of course, most of all, the future. Uh, Peter Barnard, uh, there, there's so many feelings and reactions to deal with here. First of all, uh, the sympathy for the victims of this attack, uh, which there, there really should be uh, no limit on at any point with, with anyone. And, and, and I've been in the last few days, wondering how to how to combine and take the sympathy for the victims with the attack into what should be the strategic next steps, and and I think we can all have different views of that. What what is what is your view of what the strategic next step should be? This is not a problem that ultimately has a, a military solution. Even if Hamas were to cease to exist. The Palestinian, Palestinians have been fighting Israel since long, long before Hamas was created. If Hamas de exi didn't exist tomorrow, most of the people in the Gaza are the children and grandchildren of refugees who were expelled from Israel during its war of independence and, for and then forced to live in this tiny little area. If Palestinians don't have basic rights, the basic opportunities to be citizens of the country in which they live and to ha aspire towards a better life, new Palestinian organizations will grow up. And they may do terrible things, too, because brutalized people do brutal things sometimes. The IRA bombed apartment build buildings in, in department stores in London. It was horrifying. What Hamas has done is horrifying. But the way to bring about peace is through a measure of justice. And that has to be, there has to be a political strategy to deal with that. The military strategy can bring you some time. It can kill some, some Hamas members and destroy some weapons. But you know what? It's also going to produce a whole new generation of Palestinians so deeply traumatized that they're willing to join the next Hamas and take up arms again. Uh, Rick Stingle, one of the huge differences uh, between this model and the model in Northern Ireland where the IRA eventually just tired of the fight uh, and they completely lost support of the people they were allegedly fighting for. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that there was economic hope in the alternative. And you go to Northern Ireland now and you see Belfast now, and it, it is just a, a glittering example of the economic possibility that was actually being smothered uh, by the IRA and the violence on both sides in Northern Ireland. That hope for an economic future is really hard to see in Gaza. Yes. Um, and I mean, that is a lovely vision for what could happen to the Palestinians. I still believe in a, in a two-state solution. If you look at the West Bank versus Gaza, the West Bank is more prosperous. Uh, that there has been this division between Gaza and the West Bank. And to have this kind of new dispensation, there has to be an agreement between both of them. And that looks super hard to happen right now. Uh, Robin, as we go forward through this week, uh, we're going to be go we're going to be dealing with day by day progress uh, uh, or movement in, in this new war. Uh, it seems like we may be tonight at the end of the beginning. It seems like Israel seems to have fundamentally stabilized the situation within Israel. Uh, what do you expect just for the rest of this week? Well, the hard part for Israel is that it's fighting a non-state actor, a militia. And the 73 war, which I covered as a young correspondent, was between states. And that's a far easier. You know what the address is. You know how to reach the leadership. You know what the outlines of a peace process might look like, if not the end result. The problem with Hamas is it's an absolutist ideology that wants to obliterate Israel. There's no prospect of some kind of peace agreement. And so the daily battle uh, will play out. The drama, the human drama of the hostages will traumatize, I think, the whole world as we w await their fate. 
but you know the idea that that there's uh, going to be any imminent resolution is an illusion. It's uh, this is a, a hard-fought war that is likely to play out for a considerable time, certainly far longer than the '73 war, which lasted three weeks. Uh, and you know, it's just hard to see how this is resolved in any way that guarantees either side dignity or peace or freedom. Yeah, the world should unite in the re demand of the release of those hostages.